Hey, is that Mike Lemonick? I I believe it is. Is that John Morgan? Yes. Okay. Hey, Mike. Um, so I was just trying to think how long it's been uh, that we've known each other, and it is 35 years. No, that's not possible. No, that's it's not. Oh, my gosh. It's, 1982, it's, Mike. 1982. Oh, my God. All right. Well, that's frightening. <laughs> but also, but also a good thing. It's been a, a long and productive friendship, and um, so I'll, I'll come down on the side of good. Okay. Uh, so, just for um, for the audience out there, uh, this is Mike Lemonek, the the esteemed science journalist, and uh, Mike and I went to school together, uh, eighty two and eighty three at Columbia Journalism School, and we both ended up specializing. In, uh, in science journalism, and, um, and Mike went on to Time Magazine and lots of other places and is now at Scientific American. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, Mike, before we get into specific topics, do you ever regret becoming a science journalist? Never, never, um, partly because I really still love it, and partly because there's literally nothing else I would be qualified or, uh, or able to do that I can think of, seriously. Oh. I'm sure that's not true. Uh, well, I, I, I'm I'm sure that is true. So there we go. Well, I've always felt that uh, science journalists. I don't know. You're you're more modest, I'm sure, than I am. I've always felt that science journalists have to be smarter on average than the average scientist. Let's say. So there actually are a lot of things that we we could have done besides this. Well, I think we need to be to have a broader perspective than most scientists have. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Smarter. Um, uh, we have to have a, a different kind of brain and 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 one that is willing to step back and look at things in a broader a broader way. I'm. I'm not sure we're smarter. Well, well you're I you're think, smarter. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, I'm trying to goad you into saying something that you're you're uh, going to regret right here at the okay. beginning of the conversation, <laughs> but we have plenty of time. All right. Um, I mean, just if you just tell me what you want me to say, then then no, it'll no be but easy. I want it to be totally inadvertent. Um, okay. So uh, it seems to me that one of the hardest things we have to do is is try to explain things clearly so that anybody can understand them, and that means. I assume you agree with me on this, that we have to come to at least some kind of understanding of the topic, whether it is in particle physics or uh, neuroscience. And, um, and it's really hard to do that translation. Um, yeah, it is, it is really hard. And I don't know if you've had the experience, but I certainly have, of just barely grasping what I'm trying to describe, almost like I'm hanging on to a cliff with my fingernails and not quite falling off. Um, and, and that's a kind of a scary place to be in, in, um, in sort of for somebody who claims to be explaining things accurately. And other times I, uh, there's a topic I'm much more familiar with and I feel like I'm on much more solid ground. But yeah. yes, we have, we have to understand it at least a little better than our readers do. And I think one thing I've learned over the course of my career is that it's okay to admit when you're baffled by something, when that, when the, uh, you find a, a particular theory um, really difficult to comprehend and you're sort of grasping for metaphors to try to make it comprehensible to yourself and, and then to others. And sometimes it's, it's more accurate reporting. If you just say, I just don't get this. Now, are you talking to the readers or talking to the, the person you're interviewing? Talking to the readers. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. I think that's true. It's less it's less easy to do in a very traditional, uh, you know, reporting format. Uh, much easier in what you do a lot of now, blogging, and I do some blogging myself, and and the standards of formality have relaxed a lot in 35 years. So it's acceptable to some degree in a, a pure piece of reporting. Um, but um, I agree. No, I think it's, I think it's good to be transparent with the readers. 
Yeah, I so again I, I you know I I encountered this when I was reporting on particle physics and cosmology in the early 90s and I did a couple of big articles for Scientific American on those topics and I remember being at a conference um, in Sweden with a whole bunch of of uh, brilliant cosmologists slash physicists um, Jim Peebles, Alan Guth, Stephen Hawking was there. And uh, somebody gave a talk on quantum cosmology. You know, this is baby universes and wormholes and, and this stuff. And uh, during a break, I think it was Sidney Coleman, the guy from Harvard who, who's dead now. And um, during a break, I, I, I was talking to somebody and saying, I didn't understand a word of that. And whoever it was um, said, don't worry, most of us didn't understand that either. Right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of specialization here. And when you get out of your own narrow subfield, sometimes it's really difficult to understand what your colleagues are doing. Yeah, so, I re- I'm sorry. I, I was going to say I remember that, that uh, piece you wrote um, out of that conference, which I really loved. Um, and I, I just stepped on your next question, but should I let you ask it? No, no, that's that's that, that's OK. I mean, that was that was really just the point that I I wanted to make that. That sometimes, um, you know, it's okay not to understand what the hell is going on. Yeah, uh, I um, I remember doing a uh, some reporting for a book I wrote about cosmology around that same time, and I went to visit a theorist named Dick Bond at the University of Toronto, and he said, "Oh, you know, come on into my office and you know, sit down." And he started talking, and I didn't understand a word he said from beginning to end. <laughs> And so I came out of his office with a look on my face that showed that I was kind of stunned, almost almost like I'd been whacked over the head with a, a two by four. And one of the grad students noticed me and he could see this look on my face and I didn't have to say anything. He said, don't worry, we feel that way, too. <laughs> so. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you may have heard that John McPhee, the the incredibly uh, talented and prolific New Yorker writer who sometimes writes about science has a policy that he acts even dumber than he is so that, so that, you know, if somebody will explain something to him, he'll say, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't get that. He'll do it five times in a row because he really wants to get it. And it is said that he was interviewing two geologists one day for a few hours. And when he left, one of them turned and said to the other, he's not very bright, is he? <laughs> so, so yes, it, it is acceptable not to understand, and I, I don't even know if I have John McPhee's patience to, to do it five times in a row. Yeah, uh, that that's a good rule. Um, I guess it's too late for me to learn that now. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, you, you're primarily, you have been primarily, I mean, you're, you've written about pretty much everything, but your specialty has been the physical sciences, astronomy, cosmology, uh, particle physics, and um, and yet your new book is on the brain. Uh, right. And so I, I wanted, as, as, before we get into that, um, which is harder? The physical sciences, particle physics, string theory, multiverses, or the brain? Well, so I won't give you a, a simple answer, because what fun would that be? I... Um, I am much, much less familiar with the brain. So I haven't been, you know, cosmology, particle physics, I've been reporting on pretty much since uh, we left Columbia Journalism School in 1983. And I've written two books on cosmology and two books on the search for planets around other stars. This is the stuff that I have gone into in the most depth and where I feel the most comfort. And with neuroscience, I've written about it, but only, only lightly. Uh, only rarely and not at a very deep level. So so it's a little bit comparing apples to oranges in terms of my own familiarity with the topic. And if I'd been doing neuroscience since 1983, I like to think I would understand it better than I do. But I think it is also true, objectively true, that neuroscience is vastly more complicated and mysterious. I, I think we understand how the universe works in most respects, vastly better than we understand how the brain works. I, I, uh, 
so I, I, so definitely neuroscience is harder for me and and I think objectively harder. Yeah, it is it's a paradox that that in some ways we know or at least we think we know more about the very distant reaches of of the universe and the beginnings of the universe than we know about this stuff right inside our own skulls. Yeah. Um, one of the great paradoxes of uh, modern science really. I, yeah, I think I think you're right. So, um so how did you end up writing writing uh, and by the way, let me uh I'll I'll hold up because I know you're probably too modest for self promotion. I'm holding up uh, a copy of your book now. They're perpetual now. Uh, it's really a wonderful book. Um, I read it uh, about six weeks ago before I brought you to my school, Stevens Institute, uh, to to give a talk. So could you just tell us how you came about uh, writing it? Sure. Uh, so I live in Princeton, New Jersey. I grew up here. I went to elementary school and middle school and high school here. And then I came back um, after um, after going to journalism school and settled here. And a number of people that I grew up with are still around. And one of them is a woman named Aline Johnson. I played with her in the middle school orchestra and the, the high school orchestra. We didn't know each other that well, but every decade or so, we would run into each other in the supermarket and say hello, something like that. And one day in about 2012, she uh, came up to me on the street and introduced herself, which was completely unnecessary, but uh, I, so I, I still remembered who she was, and asked if I had heard what happened to her sister. And the answer was no. And she proceeded to explain that her sister had uh, developed a brain infection, encephalitis, a viral infection of the brain. And as a result, the brain damage that it caused had put her into a state where she could not remember most of her past and could also not form new memories. So she was basically stuck in this perpetual uh, present. And Aline wanted me to write about her sister because uh, she was, she and her mother, Aline and her mother wanted this tragedy, this family tragedy to have some positive outcome. And they wanted to publicize brain research and brain science and uh, with the idea that someday we could reverse a condition like this. And as she was talking, a light went off in my head because she was describing a condition that was first described in 1953 in a patient known only as H.M. He had his memory destroyed in a very similar way, although it was uh, through surgery rather than through a viral infection. But this state that he was in for the rest of his life was one that I was rather familiar with because I'd written a number of stories about memory and he was literally the textbook case. He was the one whose uh, case showed neuroscientists for the first time that the hippocampus is vital to the uh, the production and, and retrieval of memory. Uh, hippocampus being a, a horse, a seahorse shaped structure deep inside the brain, one on each side of the brain. And if you lose two of them, if you lose both of them, as they learned to their surprise, the, the surgeons learned to their surprise with HM, you could not form new memories, you could not remember much about your past. And so in college in 1971, freshman psychology, I, I learned about the case of HM. And a number of times during my career, I wrote about memory and I had to talk about HM. So literally the textbook case. And here she was telling me about another very similar case. And my initial reaction was, oh, you know, the first case, that's really a big deal. Another case is hardly a headline. You know, second case of brain, uh, you know, memory damage. And it turns out it's not even the second case. There have been a dozen or more in the literature. So initially I thought, oh, yeah, that's very nice. I mean, it's very tragic, but it's not really that exciting. But as she talked and told me more about her sister, I began to change my mind what she was explaining to me was the fact that her sister had been a very accomplished commercial artist before she had this brain infection. She was a private pilot. She was a very skilled amateur musician. She ran two small businesses. She had enormous amounts going on and enormous areas of expertise and experience that HM had none of. And she explained that as a result 
there was far more that neuroscientists could learn by looking at her. They could probe much more deeply into the science of, or the uh, function of memory and how it works in the brain than they could with this guy who who had never held a, a steady job and had no particular intellectual pursuits. And so I got more in, and she said, you know, we're, uh, we're working with neuroscientists right now, and you could come along to the testing sessions. And I decided I would give it a try. And as I began to learn more about the story from Aline Johnson and her mother, as I began to sit around on these research sessions with scientists from both Johns Hopkins and Princeton universities, I realized this was a very, very rich story of an extraordinarily talented and driven woman who had all of this snatched away. And I wanted to tell her story, what, she, what her life was like, who she was before the memory loss, what happened to her, which was quite dramatic in itself, and and what what's going on now with the testing and what, what is her life like. And mostly, this is what had intrigued me from the first time I'd heard of HM. Mostly, I was just intensely curious about what it must be like to be in this state. And, and so I wanted to find out as best I could. Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you, I, this is kind of a journalist to journalist uh, question, um, but I'm curious, this was a really personal story, and you obviously spent a lot of time uh, with Lonnie Sue and with these scientists and, and Lonnie Sue's family, and um, I'm just curious about the degree to which the personal relationships that you form with these people and your portrayal of Lonnie Sue especially was really affectionate. I think that's that was one reason uh, why it was so uh, vivid. But is that difficult to be a journalist reporting supposedly objectively about the science and about these uh, the scientists and the subjects and so forth um, and uh, and yet um, not hurt anybody's feelings. Uh, in other words, are those, does that create any tension or conflict in you um, when you're handling a, a story like this? Yeah, that, that's a really uh, good question. Um, it is true that if you develop an affection for your subjects, it is, you're reluctant to hurt their feelings. And that was the case for me. Um, I really did like these people, but I, and my, my inclination, my, my, uh, temperament is such that I really like, I consider myself a nice guy. I don't like getting in people's face and, and, you know, revealing their deep, dark secrets. I, that, I wouldn't be a great investigative journalist because you have to have sort of an instinct for the jugular which I don't have and I don't want. And I probably would not have embarked on this story if I hadn't liked the people involved, hadn't want, wanted to tell their stories, not sort of get the goods on them. And so that was a factor. And yes, if you, if in some of the journalism classes we attended at Columbia, the professors would have yelled at me for, you know, for, for being too kind. So what am I going to do? I can live with that. Um, there were things that I discovered in this reporting that made uh, Aline Johnson in particular very uncomfortable, that she didn't like at all. That's the um, sister. Th that's the sister. She was there, and it was interesting. She So to show you I wasn't entirely nice, in hearing the story of Lonnie Sue's life from Aline and, and their mother, uh, there were situations and people that they mentioned that I clearly needed to talk to uh, talk to her or find out more about. So, for example, the person who discovered Lonnie Sue in a state of advanced fever and, and confusion in the farmhouse where she lived alone was a um, a guy uh, a cat, a dairy farmer who was her partner in this organic dairy business, and he also was really in love with her and he wanted to marry her and she wasn't interested. And they, uh, Aline and Maggie, the mother, told me in passing about this guy who found her and took her to the hospital. 
And at a certain point, I said, well, I, I really need to talk to him, you know, because he knew her very well toward the end of her life, or the end, I'm sorry, the end of her, of her um, intact life. And Aline's reaction was immediate. She said, no, you, you don't need to talk to him. He's very busy. You really don't. I wouldn't do that. And I'm thinking, that's, you know, that's strange. Why, why doesn't she want me to talk to this guy? And my second thought was, I'm going to talk to this guy. You know, if, if she wants to, uh, has something to hide, I need to know what it is. And I finally did track him down and had an interview with him. And it turns out that he had a perspective on on Aline and on Lonnie Sue and on the, the relationship that was not the one that Aline preferred to have told. Um, it, uh, a story of unrequited love and a, a, a story of um, some tension between this um, this dairy farmer and Aline when after Lonnie Sue was injured and Aline was living in the farmhouse putting uh, putting Lonnie Sue's affairs in order and, and you know closing bank accounts and so on there was a fair amount of tension and. Aline wanted a nice story. Every everything needed to be nice, and some of it wasn't nice. And so I felt compelled to do that. Another another thing that came up in interviews with people living in the Cooperstown, New York area, which is where Lonnie Sue was for the last ten years before she got injured or before she got ill, um, came out that there had been some kind of traumatic event in Lonnie Sue's adult life. Um, some kind of physical and verbal abuse from an emotional abuse from some person she was in a relationship with. And, you know, I asked Aline about that. She said, Oh no, no, I don't, I don't know anything about that, but I had to find out because this might have some kind of impact on, on her story and why she chose to live in this remote uh, part of New York state. And so I found people and they talked to me about it and I put that in the book. And again, Aline was, was not happy at all about that so yeah go ahead your j school professors would be proud uh, to a degree yes they would <laughs> and nobody nobody was you know stealing any money or bribing people or you know um, or selling drugs so so there were none of that kind of stuff to to uncover so um in terms of what lonnie sue is revealing the studies of, of or her case are revealing it seemed to me that that uh, one of the uh, that that one opportunity that we have in studying her, as opposed to H M, is as you say that uh, you know, she was an artist. She's a creative person, and so we're learning not just about memory but about creativity. Right. And I I wonder if and some of my favorite parts of uh, your book were uh, where you're talking about how she started doing art again and what her yeah. art was like. Um, how it was limited, but how it was still very expressive in some ways. So yes. I wonder if we, I wonder if you could talk about uh, about that part of her case. Sure. So so she was a very a very accomplished commercial artist. She drew covers for the New Yorker magazine and and other sort of high profile clients. And she had a style that can best be described as charming and whimsical. So um, her her artwork often. Uh, featured little tiny people perched on tops of bookcases and and uh, and airplanes because she loved airplanes and fanciful suns and moons in the sky and also it involved kind of visual puns and um, so it was there, there was a lot of thought behind this artwork as well as of uh, uh, pure artistic talent and creativity and after the injury um, first of all the the um, Infection caused her brain to swell and, and did temporary damage to many um, aspects of, of her function. So she couldn't speak at first. Uh, she couldn't walk. She couldn't even sit up in bed. And gradually those things returned. Uh, she learned to walk again. She learned to talk again. Uh, she learned to feed herself. Um, but the memory itself did not come back. But what also didn't come back in any strong way was her artistic expression, her need to express herself artistically. And this was very um, upsetting to both Aline and their mother, Maggie, 
especially Maggie, who herself is an artist and who was Lonnie Sue's first art teacher. And she knew how deeply Lonnie Sue cared about art and being an artist and expressing herself visually. And, and so she pushed her. She pushed her to, uh, to start drawing again. And at first, they would have to put the pencil in Lonnie Sue's hand and force it down to the page, and she would draw a line and then give up. She had no motivation. And, and they kept pushing and pushing, and in one um, uh, sort of episode early on, Maggie did a, played a game with her that they used to play when they, she was young. Maggie would draw a line. She drew a line in, in blue, I think it was. And then she handed a red pen to Lonnie Sue and said, okay, you draw the next line. And there was no plan for what would emerge. And they would alternate drawing lines. Uh, but what emerged was a picture of, of a group of cats sitting around. Lonnie Sue loved cats. And so, so Maggie really was training Lonnie Sue to, um, to recover that ability that she had had and which was still, they hoped, locked inside her. And, and, you know, she, she would draw um, eventually, but not with any passion, not with any, um, uh, any, um, any motivation. She had been almost uh, obsessive, a real type A personality about her work and about being productive. And here she was just uninspired by anything. Uh, she also le uh, learned to play the viola again, which she had played before, um, and to read music. And she would play the viola but only when you put it in her hands and said, okay, play, play a tune. And then she'd put it down and she wouldn't care. So, so th the ability might be there, but there was no motivation. And I, I hope this is not too long a story, but, but no, no. I'm getting to the good part. Um, and the, the, the most bizarre thing happened about a year after uh, the illness. Aline Johnson was out walking, just taking a walk and ran into an old friend of hers. She hadn't seen in years. And this woman, whose name was Amy Goldstein, uh, you know, caught her up and said, oh, you know, what are you doing now? Um, Amy, I'm, I'm a puzzle writer. I write word search puzzles where there are letters hidden in a, uh, words hidden in a grid of letters and you find the word and you circle it. And that's what I do for a living. Who, who knew that somebody could make a living doing this? And then Aline told her about this tragedy and Amy was, was very upset, of course, and said maybe she would like to do some word search puzzles. And Aline was like, okay, maybe, yeah, yeah, let's try some. And so uh, Amy gave her some word search puzzles, and it was as though a switch had been thrown. Lonnie Sue, who not only loved verbal, I mean, uh, visual puns, also loved verbal puns and wordplay, and she, it was like a switch was thrown, and she just dove into these puzzles with passion. Nobody had seen any passion in her for a year. She was passionate about them. And she, when she finished the puzzle books, she started creating her own word search puzzles. Both Maggie and Aline were amazed by this. And shortly after she began doing her own word search puzzles, she began illustrating them. And that's where the art comes back in. And her illustrations became more and more elaborate to the point where you could see that old personal style creeping back in and, and there were little people again. That's in fact, uh, Eileen told me when the little people came back, that's when we knew that she was recovering her art. I, I'm not and, sure. If, yeah. Can you see that I'm holding up uh, the, the wonderful reproductions you have of some of her artwork. I don't know if anybody's going to be able to see this on the uh, blogging heads TV, but uh but you can see the complexity of it. It's really remarkable. Um, it really is, yes. And, and you know, before she got those word search puzzles, nobody was convinced that she would ever do art again. Yeah, so I'm, I want to ask a, a sort of broader question about this type of research. First of all, it, um, to make it really general, uh, this is um, – this is a case study, and it seems to me that uh, brain science has been, from the very start, really dependent on uh, case studies, very in-depth examinations of individuals. You go back to Freud. Freud, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, 
he was a master of the case study and a lot yes. of um, his power as a as a scientist and a proselytizer for his particular way of looking at the mind came from his his uh, descriptions of individual patients uh, right. he treated for in some cases very strange diseases you have this up through um, uh, Luria the great uh, great neuroscientist and of course uh, everybody is familiar with uh, the writings of Oliver Sacks about individual patients and I just wonder about if you could talk about the I don't know the the, the, the pros and cons of this way of learning about um, about how our, our brains work right well so the cons are, are, are obvious I think that that individual cases are very individual and they don't necessarily generalize um, to to um, to everyone. So so um, you know we we all have we're all born with different uh, mental capacities. Our brains are slightly different physically, although although you know we all have the same. Everybody with a, a normal brain has the same organs or sub-organs within the brain, but but uh, their size and their shape and their exact structure um, varies from one person to the next. And the um, so when you say, when you make generaliza generalizations based on one person, as, as they did starting with HM, it's, it's sort of broadly true what they're discovering, but it's not specific enough that you can you can make firm statements about how memory in general works. You talk about how memory works in this one person. And the more, so, so the more cases you accumulate, the better and, and compare with each other. And the other thing is that, that the exact pattern of damage is different in each patient. So when, when uh, William Scoville suctioned out Henry, uh, Henry Mullison's, Hippocampi, his name was revealed on his death in 2008. So HM was Henry Mullison. When he suctioned out uh, the hippocampus on both sides of, of Henry's brain, he didn't get all of it because, you know, he was going blind. He was he, uh, he was he could not see what he was doing. He was sort of reaching in with an instrument um, and he got some extra tissue that he didn't mean to. And so it was a very idiosyncratic pattern of damage uh, with Lonnie Sue and other encephalitis patients. The virus tends to attack the medial temporal lobes, which includes the hippocampus and a couple of, of nearby structures, but it doesn't limit itself to exactly those tissues, and it doesn't always take all of them, and sometimes it you know goes over the edges, and so so um, you know teasing out the differences in in um, in structure between one form of brain damage and the next are difficult. And, um, and so we're, you know, we're, we're approximating what we're, our understanding is, is uh, converging toward a, a general theory of memory, but, but the specifics do vary from one individual to the next. The other thing is that HM had his operation originally because he suffered from epilepsy. And this was a, a, a desperate, attempt to control the epilepsy, well, the epilepsy itself probably caused some kinds of brain damage. And so, and then I, I layered on top of that is his own experience versus Lottie Sue's own experience versus the experience of other amnesia victims who have been studied means that the individual um, case it's, itself is not definitive ever. Um, it's only the accumulation of different cases. The other difference uh, between Freud and uh, these modern neuroscientists is that they neuroscientists have done studies on animals and they've damaged specific structures and and seen what the result is and so there's that second line of investigation that that uh, that helps to reinforce or expand on what we know from these individual cases and while there have only been a handful of human amnesia victims they're probably been many thousands of rats and probably some monkeys and, and chimpanzees too before that became um, a less um, acceptable way of doing research. So you um, you said that uh, 
still you were converging toward a theory of memory. And um, let me uh, dig into that a little bit. Do you, it's my impression, I've been writing about neuroscience for a long time, and, uh, and it's my impression that um, we're in this weird situation when it comes to the brain where we're, I think uh, neuroscience is one of the fastest moving, uh, most dynamic fields, lots of people uh, going into it, the, the Society for Neuroscience has grown enormously over the last couple of decades. Uh, tens of thousands of uh, uh, people belong to the society now. Um, and yet, it seems as though rather than converging on a, on a general theory of how the brain works or even how just one cognitive function like, uh, like memory works, um, the researchers are becoming overwhelmed with detail. And then the deeper they go, instead of getting more clarity, they're getting more complexity and often theoretical confusion. Um, yes. I wonder if that, I wonder if that's my impression. I wonder what, what your impression is. Well, so I, I agree. And in fact, this is one thing I found daunting about doing this book. Uh, whenever I see a new study out on, on neuroscience of any kind, it always seems so incredibly narrow and particular and I have no sense of where it fits into some larger larger theory and I think that this is because it doesn't at this point um, at least for how the brain works and even how memory works in a very specific uh, and detailed way you know we, we get all these data points and we don't even know how they relate to other data points um, and there, there, there are issues of, you know, what does a finding about a particular group of neurons, how does that um, integrate with our more a broader understanding of what a particular region of the brain does? And how does that integrate with our understanding how, of how that region integrates with the rest of the brain? It's, it's incredibly complicated. And I think we are still in a stage of sort of shining our flashlight in the dark and picking out um, features and finding them interesting, but not knowing what the whole thing looks like. So when I say we're, we are converging on a theory of memory, I don't think we're close to being there. I think so. So to be more concrete, we know with almost a hundred percent certainty that if you remove both hippocampi from a human or a, a higher mammal, it devastates their memory. So hippocampus is crucial to memory is something that we can say with, with real certainty. Um, uh, where it gets um, a bit muddier is exactly what function the hippocampus serves in, in uh, allowing us to have memories and whether there are forms of memory that are not um, not conscious memories that the hippocampus doesn't necessarily have to be there for. And we know even as long back, as far back as HM, that, that that is the case. So one of the tests they did on HM was to try to get him to acquire a new physical skill. And that particular skill they tried was having him draw, uh, trace the image of a star on a piece of paper with a pencil, but not looking at his hand, looking at an image of his hand in a mirror. And if you've ever tried something like that, it's, at first it's nearly impossible. You know, you you will your hand to move to the right and you see it moving to the left and you try and control it and then you go the, the wrong way. Very, very awkward. But if you keep practicing, you get better and better and better at it. And they tried this with HM and after five or six testing sessions, he was markedly better. He had no memory of ever having done this test before. So the 10th time he did it, he thought it was the first time. But he was much better than he had been the first time. So clearly some kind of learning was taking place, and that learning was being stored in the form of, of a, a what we colloquial call, colloquially call a muscle memory somewhere. And he had no hippocampi, so it wasn't there. And so we began to understand that there are levels of memory that are well below the surface that really do count as memory. So when I 
when I um, drive from my house to the train station to commute into New York, I don't have to think about, well, okay, first I go to this street and then I turn left and then I, I uh, go for 2.32 miles and then I turn right. I don't do any of that because I've done it so many times. I know it. If you ask me to describe exactly how to do it, I might not be able to. Uh, because I don't know how many miles you drive and exactly what street you turn left on. Uh, but my, but I've learned unconsciously this route and, and many other routes and many other um, uh, situations in my life. So we are learning that memory is deeper than simply conscious memory, far deeper. And we're learning what parts of that memory are require the hippocampus and what parts don't. So that, that's what I mean when I say we're moving toward a theory. So I, I want to ask you another uh, question about, uh, about a, uh, a really deep theme of your book, uh, and especially emerged, emerged toward the end. Um, so just to set up the question, um, you know, some of my best friends are, are really into Buddhism. In fact, Robert Wright uh, who runs Boggy and Head TV, uh, meditates a lot, and he just wrote a, a book that's coming out this summer about Buddhism. And one of the doctrines of uh, Buddhism is, is called anatta, and it says that the self doesn't really exist. If you try to identify what the self is, where it is, what constitutes the self, you just find yourself grasping at shadows. And... Um, and I wonder if you could comment on that um, from the point of view of the case of Lonnie Sue. What about herself? How was herself damaged by the profound loss of her memories? Right. Well, so it's not just uh, Buddhism says that. Doesn't Daniel Dennett say it also? Yes. Um, um, yeah, so the idea that consciousness is actually uh, is an illusion created by our, our brains is one of those bizarre theories I'm not sure I, I buy, but um, yeah, so so in fact, going into this book, I had this sense that, you know, I, I have a very rich set of memories, and the, the person that I am, I mean, my, myself, as I, as I think of it, is, is the sum total of those memories, and if I had no access to them, I don't, I, myself would be gone, that was my, my sort of assumption. And in fact, the working title of this book was The Woman Who Lost Herself. And as I interviewed Lonnie Sue, which I did several times, it's a bit of a frustrating experience because the conversations tend to be quite circular. Um, and they, and there's, there's really nothing new that she ever says. But anyway, very interesting to, to talk to her and then seeing her interact with other people and seeing other people's reaction to her. She's before the illness, she was people almost universally described her as somebody who, some, who, who you were drawn to. You just, you fell in love with her, not romantically necessarily, but you just felt that you wanted to, to be with this person and, and spend time with her. She just drew people to her. Um, since the injury, I've experienced her as charming, witty, hilarious, you know, engaging, um, essentially the same things that were the essence of who she was before the illness. And the, the, the part that's missing, obviously, is, is specific memories. She, can, she cannot talk about any specific incident in, in her past. She can't form new memories of, of, of incidents although she could learn in that, that other way I described. And, and I came to realize or to, uh, to believe, especially after talking to a couple of people who think, uh, neuroscientists who think specifically about consciousness, that those things are not really essential to who she is. Um, and so, so, and maybe it's because consciousness is some sort of illusion that, that there, it, it, you can't pin it down. Um, and the, that combination of experiencing her, I mean, the, the, she is so funny and charming that 
more than once I've seen the neuroscientists have to stop in the middle of a testing session because she just cracked everybody up and they, they, that, they just had to laugh and, and they had to stop for a minute and gather themselves. Um, and after many of the testing sessions, the scientists and the family would sit down to lunch and just chat you know, like friends. It, I mean, so, and Lonnie, she was always very charming there too. So, so I came to believe that that, that I was incorrect. My assumption was incorrect. It was not her memories that made her who she was. It was the essence of, of her personality, which came out intact, really intact from, from this terrible injury. And so I had to change the title of the book to the perpetual now. Um, I think I found that the most moving part of your book, that the idea that in spite of this terrible um, damage that she had endured, that she, herself had come through in some sense. Yes. Uh, so that was really moving. Now, if she had been a, a terrible, terrible person, <laughs> then maybe right. it would have been um, maybe not so moving or... Uh, <laughs> Well, right. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's – and not everybody who has this kind of in injury comes through the way she did. So there's a, a case from the 1980s of a British musician and, and a radio producer named Clive Waring who had the same kind of infection, same kind of damage, but he lived in a state of perpetual anxiety and, and fear and disorientation, at least for the first – many years after his, his uh, injury, after his illness. I keep saying injury because the illness does injure the brain. Um, and you watch, you can, there's a, a documentary about him, and it's, it's a little painful to watch. He's just, he's just agitated constantly. And he was never studied in any depth because he couldn't calm down enough to you know, sit still for testing. Hmm. Um, so I wanted to ask about um, some practical uh, possible applications of, of this kind of research on memory. Um, and so I'll, I'll just throw out some, some ideas and get your reaction uh, to them. What about uh, how close might we be to memory prosthetics? In other words, some kind of chip that could be put in the brain possibly to um, uh, supplement uh, or, or be a substitute for damaged brain tissue, maybe even help people overcome the uh, effects of Alzheimer's disease, let's say. Right. Well, so this is not something I went into in great depth because nobody's talking about that with respect to Lonnie Sue. I see those reports as well or, you know, of, of initial uh, you know, rudimentary experiments with that kind of thing. Um, I think that because we don't truly understand how the brain works, I'm very skeptical that we're anywhere close to being able to, to do that. I mean, I just, I, I can't give you, you know, a time frame, but, but until you understand in some detail how the thing that you're trying to fix worked in the first place, I'm not sure how you can design a, a workaround for it. Would that would you think that would hold true also for memory deletion devices? I've I've seen reports here and there over the years on um, on uh, some sort of treatment that could uh, wipe out a really traumatic event, uh, for example. And um, and you know this was a theme of the film Eternal Sunshine, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. If right. there's some horrible memory that is tormenting you. Uh, in the case of the movie, it was just a uh, a love affair that had gone bad. Uh, right. That you can just wipe that out of your brain and right. be happy. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not sure about a device that could do that. It, it, I mean, because you would have to literally know the specific neurons, I think, where that where that memory um, was stored. And I, I just, I can't imagine we're at that level of specificity right. yet. I mean, we can see, we can see a sort of a general area of the brain becoming more active when we're doing certain things. But even then, we're not exactly sure what that means. Um, more, um, more likely is, you know, people have have learned a fair amount about false memories and about the way memories are stored and retrieved and then 
put back uh, in an altered form because it turns out that every time you retrieve a memory, you um, are likely to contaminate it with other things that you've learned about the about that event. The the, the best known examples are um, are sort of major major world events like 9-11 or, or the Challenger explosion or the uh, de- uh, assassination of John F. Kennedy. You know, many of us uh, in, in yours and my age group have vivid, vivid memories of exactly what played out at those times. But it turns out that they're probably not entirely correct because when we think of those, we talk to other people who had their own experiences. We sometimes incorporate their experiences into ours or we watch a documentary and incorporate that into what we think is our own original memory. And there's been some pretty good work, I think, with victims of PTSD who have a traumatic experience that they keep reliving in a very vivid way. And there have been certainly experiments with techniques to retrieve those memories in the company of a, of a therapist and modify them the way our brain normally would to remove some of their, um, their uh, voltage. And I don't know that, the, that this has been perfected yet, but there are ways to alter memories without a device simply by, by uh, you know, talk, talk therapy and maybe with some medications included. So, so I think we actually are closer to being able to delete or at least soften unpleasant memories without some kind of fancy, you know, zapping machine um, than we are with technology. And as far as uh, brain, um, I can't remember what you use, but but uh, prosthetics, it turns out that there are, are people in um, uh, Toronto at the Bayview Medical Center who have been working very actively at helping people with Alzheimer's uh, supplement their memories simply by the use of smartphones. So, so if you've got a smartphone with, with uh, face recognition in it and uh, you've got Alzheimer's and somebody walks into the room and you have no idea who they are, the phone does know who they are if it's been entered and can tell you. And so in a way, you're, you're carrying a piece of your brain, um, your supplementary brain around in your, in your uh, phone case. I actually could use something like that. Yeah, me too. Now, um, all right. I, I have. I, I have to ask you, and I, I think I can sense where you're going um, about the singularity, which is kind of the the ultimate vision of um, the triumph of brain science. That that uh, that we are going to know so much about how our brains work that we will be able to transform them into giant digital programs. This is one version of the singularity, but it's the most dramatic and and digitize our psyches and possibly upload them into uh, computers where they can live forever and mutate and become super intelligent. What, what I found remarkable about um, this idea is that some of the smartest people and, and very powerful and successful people uh, uh, in this country seem to believe in this idea. Ray Kurzweil is one, a very successful engineer who now is, uh, is a very high-ranking person in Google. The two founders of Google also are apparently uh, entranced by the singularity. Bill Gates has written blurbs for the, for the books of Ray Kurzweil. What do you make of this belief? Well, so, so Richard Feynman uh, once made a profound statement, um, and not quite in this context, he was talking to, to scientists who think they've got an amazing result. And he said, you must be very careful not to fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. So if there's something um, that you passionately want to be true, it's very easy to fool yourself into thinking it is true. And that's true, you know, for, for a, an amazing result in the lab. You know, if you don't really, really look at it hard and try and disprove it yourself, um, uh, you might publish something that's nonsense, and then somebody else will disprove it, and you'll be embarrassed. Um, I, you know, I guess we all want to live forever, um, and I don't think that Ray Kurzweil or Bill Gates is immune from that. And in a purely hypothetical sense, once we understand the brain 
completely and how it works. Sure, it is, and and with a a, um, uh, a comparable increase in the in computing power, which we seem to be getting still all the time. Moore's law is still in operation, evidently. Um, it is easy to imagine a day someday in the future when you will be able to upload your brain to some kind of computer and your uh, and the the brain in, or the computer will be will be you it will be no different from you except maybe uh, faster and smarter and so hypothetically sure it doesn't seem crazy I mean I think that you know I certainly am I certainly agree that everything that goes on in the brain is physical there's not some kind of mystical soul you know hanging around and some kind of magic that, that you know supernatural processes going on it's all physical and if we understand that at a level of high high precision it would be possible to simulate that in, in, a, in a computer but i don't think we're anywhere near you know, I think Kurzweil thinks the singularity is happening in 2050 or something. Um, I that's think his even projection. sooner than that. Yeah. Sooner than that. And he's taking many, many multivitamins every day so he can live long enough to, to be uploaded. Yes. Um, um, and, and um, you know, I just think that people want it to be – so, again, I think it is, in principle, possible. Um, I think the idea that it will happen – any time in our life lifetimes or in our children's or grandchildren's or great grandchildren's lifetimes, I have no reason to believe that's a serious idea. Darn. Um, <laughs> all right. One more question, Mike, because uh, we uh, we're almost out of time. Okay. Um, I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on this, the, uh, the science march. Uh, whether you think it's it's a it's a fantastic idea, whether you have any qualms about it, I'm trying to figure out what I think. So I, that's why I'm asking you, putting you on the spot. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with the motivation. You know, science uh, science has been under attack by politicians for a long time. You remember uh, William Proxmire in the 70s, the Democratic senator who would make fun of of, uh, of scientific research that sounded silly to him. Of course, he was ignorant, so. It was easy for something to sound silly to him. So it's not a new phenomenon, but it's, of course, vastly worse now. And things that we that everybody kind of agreed on um, in, in the political realm and the scientific realm, such as climate change and the human contribution, we now know when people now agree less and, and are sort of pro promulgating complete nonsense about it. So so um, thanks mostly to politics and um, and religion, I guess, uh, we've become stupider in general. And now Trump is is cutting all sorts of planning to cut all sorts of scientific research funding um, so that he can make the uh, military even more bloated. And so the impulse to, to march and and show that people a lot of people do not approve of this, I think, is a great one. Um, and the question of whether it is likely to be effective is another thing. I don't know. I, you know, if you're dealing with politicians, because it's aimed at politicians, really, um, the politicians who will, do not act except in their own self-interest, um, generally. And so, so whether they will look up and say, "Oh my goodness," you know, the people are are on the march, and we must change our our evil ways. I don't know. I don't know. And then there's uh, also people are worrying about a backlash um, uh, and a uh, situation where science now becomes associated with uh, uh, liberal politics and further alienates people who are already hostile to science. That's possible that that would happen. Um, uh, other thing people are worrying about is that many of the marchers don't want to limit what they're protesting to pure science, but to also to issues of diversity and and sexism and racism, um, all of which affect scientists uh, the way they affect everybody else. And so some some people say it should be pure science. No, we, there's no such thing as pure science. I don't know. There's a lot of, of sort of argument back and forth about whether it's a good idea, whether it's going to be effective. 
um, whether there whether there will be a backlash. I don't know the answers to any of those things. Uh, my impulse would be to go march because I do think science is science is under siege like never before. But um, as a uh, staff editor at Scientific American, it's journalistically unethical for me to do so, except to cover the march. Mm-hmm. So I'm allowed to go cover it, but I'm not really allowed to walk around with a sign, uh, you know, protesting. Really? I, is that your personal ethical policy? No, that's, that, that is our, our, um, our house policy. Wow. I, I, I I'm surprised. Uh, that's- well, I think, I think there, that's not the only organization, journalistic organization, that feels that way. Yeah, uh, that's I think it, NPR. I think has the same policy. I think the New York Times also. Uh huh. Um. So, but are you going to cover it, or is anybody from Scientific? Oh American? yes, absolutely. We, we're going to have people covering it. I'm not sure I am going to cover it in particular. I'm not. You know, I'm an editor. I'm not really um, a reporter or writer anymore. And and we do have plenty of those. And we also have scientists. I'm the opinion editor at Scientific American, which means I bring in, among other things, I bring in um, guest editorials. And we've got a number of those from scientists talking about why they are marching and and why they think this is important. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for giving me your thoughts because, yeah, I'm I'm still trying to figure out what I think about it. Um, And thanks for being here on Blogging Heads, Mike. This is wow. this is a real treat for me and and uh, I'm sure for the viewers out there. Well, it's always fun to talk to you, whether we're on blogging heads or in person or whatever.